the subject of atomic physics, lecture number 13, same solids, conductors and semiconductors. Solid state physics is a vast area of quantum physics in which we are concerned with understanding the mechanical, thermal, electrical, magnetic and optical properties of solid matter. Some aspects have been discussed in AL chap chapters, such as the lattice and electronic contributions to the specific heats of solids, radiation from a black body, thermionic emission and contact potentials. Here we shall focus on the origin of the forces that hold atoms together in a solid and on, on the alloyed energy levels in the, of the electrons in the solid. This will be led us to the band theory of solids. The theory will then be applied to phenomena of much practical and theoretical interest, including semiconductors and semiconductor devices. Many electrical, thermal and optical properties of solids will thereby become more clearly understood. In the gaseous state, the average distance between molecules is large compared to the size of the molecule, so the molecules may be regarded as isolated from one other another. Many substances, however, are in the solid state at ordinary temperatures and pressures. In that state molecules or atoms can no longer be regarded as isolated. Their separation is comparable to the molecular size and the strength of the forces holding them together is of the same order of magnitude as the forces binding the atoms into a molecule. Hence, the properties of a molecule are altered by the presence of the neighboring molecules. Characteristic of crystalline solids is the regular arrangement of atoms. A recurrent or periodic pattern called a crystal lattice. The solid can be regarded as a large molecule, the forces between atoms being due to the interaction between atomic electrons and the structure of the solid being determined as the arrangement of nuclei and electrons which wields a quantum mechanically stable system. Also, the number of atoms involved is very large. They are arranged in a regular pattern. In non-crystalline solids, such as the concrete and plastic, the perfectly regular pattern does not hold over long distances, but there is an orderly pattern in the neighborhood of any one atom. We shall discuss only crystalline solids. Such solids are classified according to the predominant type of binding, the principal types being molecular, ionic, covalent and metallic. Molecular solids consist of molecules which are so stable that they retain much as they are individually when borrowed in the close proximity. The electrons in the molecule are all paired so that atoms in different molecules cannot form covalent bonds with one other. The intermolecular binding force is a weak van der Waals attraction that is present between such molecules in the gaseous phase. The physical mechanism involved in the van der Waals attraction is an interaction between electric dipoles. Because of the fluctuating quantum mechanical behavior of the electrons in molecular, all molecules have a fluctuating electric dipole moment, even so for many of the symmetry considerations require that it fluctuate about an average value of zero. At a time when a molecule has a certain instantaneous electric dipole moment, the external electric field that is produced with induced in the charge distribution of a nearby molecular a dipole moment. The interaction energy is proportional to the mean square of the inducing electric dipole moment. The resulting attraction is weak, the binding energies being of the order of 10 to minus 2 power electron volt and the force varying with the inverse seventh power of the intermolecular separation. In the solid, successive molecules have electric dipole moments which alternate in orientation so as to produce successive attractions. 
many organic compounds, inert gases and ordinary gases such as oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen form molecular solids in the solid state. Because the binding is weak, the solidification takes place only at very low temperatures where the disruptive effects of the thermal agitation are very small. The melting point of solid hydrogen is 14 Kelvin degree, for example. The weak binding makes molecules, molecular solids easy to deform and compress and the absence of free electrons makes them very poor conductors of heat or electricity. Ionic solids, such as sodium chloride, consist of close regular three-dimensional array of alternating positive and negative ions having a low energy than the separated ions. The structure is stable because the binding energy due to the net electrostatic attraction exceeds the energy spent in transferring electrons to cre create the isolate ions from nature, natural atoms just as for ionic binding in molecules. Ionic binding in solids is not directional because spherically symmetrical closed shell ions are involved. Hence the ions are arranged like closed packet spheres. The actual crystal geometry depends on which arrangement minimizes the energy and this in turn depends principally on the relative sizes of the ions involved. Because there are no three electrons to carry energy or charge from one part of the solid to another, such solids are proof conductors of, of heat or electricity. Because of the strong electrostatic forces between the ions, ionic solids are usually hard and have higher melting points. Lattice vibrations can be excited by energies corresponding to radiation in the far infrared so that ionic solids show strong optical absorption properties in that region. But optical absorption by excitation of electrons requires energies in the ultraviolet so that ionic crystals are transparent to visible radiation. Covalent solids contain atoms that are bound by short valence electrons such as in covalent binding of molecules. The bonds are directional and determine the geometrical arrangement of atoms in the crystal structure. The rigidity of the electronic structure makes covalent solids hard and difficult to deform and it accounts for their higher melting points. Because there are no free electrons, Covalent solids are not good heat or electrical conductors. Sometimes, as for silicon and germanium, there are semiconductors. At room temperature, some covalent solids, such as diamond, are transparent. The energy required to excite the electronic states exceeds that of the photons in the visible region of the spectrum so that such photons are not absorbed. But most covalent solids absorbed in the visible and the, therefore opaque. Metallic solids exhibit a binding that can be thought as a li limiting case of covalent binding in which electrons are shared by all the ions in the crystal. When a crystal is formed of atoms having a few weakly bound electrons, in the outermost subshells, electrons can be freed from the individual atoms by the energy released in binding. These electrons move in the combinate potential of all the positive ions and are shared by all the atoms in the crystal. We speak on electron gas interpassed between the positive ions and exerting extractive forces on each ion that exceed the repulsive forces of other ions hence the binding. The atoms have vacancies in their outermost electron subshell and they are not enough valence electrons per atom to form light covalent bonds. The electrons are shared by all the atoms and are free to wander through the crystal from atom to atom, there being many unoccupied electronic states. In this sense, they have behave like a gas and electron gas. A metallic solid is a regular lattice 
of spherically symmetrical positive ions arranged like closed packet spheres, so which the electrons move. Metallic solids are obviously excellent conductors of electricity or heat. The electrons easily absorbing energy from incident radiation or lattice vibrations and moving under the influence of the applied electric field or thermal gradient. Because radiation in the visible region portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is easily absorbed, such solids are opaque. All the alkalis form metallic solids. The type of bending that a particular solid has is determined experimentally by studies of X-ray diffraction, dielectric properties, optical emissions and so forth. There are some solids whose bending must be interpreted as a mixture of the principal types we have described. In addition, not all solids have the ideal structure implied by the discussion so far. Indeed, the so-called lattice inter imperfections or the deviations from ideal crystal structure led to many properties of solids which have practical consequences. To understand the effect of putting a great many atoms close together in a solid, consider first two atoms only that are initially far apart. All of the energy levels of these two atom system have a two-fold exchange degeneracy. That is for the combinate system, the space part of the aging function for the electrons can contain either a combination of the individual atom space aging functions, which is symmetric in the exchange of pairs of electron labels, or which is anti-symmetric in such a label exchange. The total aging function of the system of electrons is of course anti-symmetric since the symmetric space aging function is associated with an anti-symmetric spin aging function, and vice versa. When the atoms are widely separated, the two different types of aging functions lead to the same energy, and so each of the energy levels is said to have a two-fold exchange degeneracy. But when the atoms are brought together, the exchange degeneracy is removed. Because the electron charge density in the important region between the atoms depends on whether the space engine function is symmetric or anti-symmetric. When the atoms are close enough together that the wave functions of the individual atoms overlap. The energy of the system depends on the symmetry of the space engine function. Hence, a given energy level of the system is split in two distinct energy levels as overlap commences and the splitting increases as the separation of the atom decreases. Of course, a famous example of this phenomenon is found in the ground state energy level of the system containing two hydrogen atoms. It is shown that the splitting for the ground state level only, but each of the higher levels of the system splits in the same way and for the same reason as the atoms are brought together. If you had started with three isolated atoms, we would have had a threefold exchange degeneracy of the energy levels. When the atoms are brought together in a uniform linear lattice, each on the level splits in, into three distinct levels. Figure 1 illustrates the schematically for a typical energy level of a system of six atoms. The splitting commences when the center-to-center -center atomic separation R becomes small enough for the atoms to begin overlapping. As R decreases from this value, there is a decrease in the energy of the levels for which the symmetry of the space aging function leads to a favorable electron charge distribution, it is which puts electron charge where the ions exert the stronger binding and an increase in the energy of the levels associated with space engine functions, whose symmetry leads to an ultra-favorable, unfavorable charge distribution. The more favorable or unfavorable the charge distribution is the greater is the decrease or increase in this energy. So the levels are spread by the quantum mechanical requirements of indistinguishability about 
average energy equal to the energy the system would have a given R if there were no such requirements. Note that this average energy begins to increase rapidly for sufficiently small R. This is due to the Coulomb repulsion that the ions exert on each other. Figure 1 Schematic drawing of the splitting of energy level in the system of six atoms as a function of the separation distance R between adjustment, adjacent atoms. The space and the function of the level at the top of the band is antisymmetric with respect to a, a time label in exchange, and the one at the bottom of symmetric with respect to such an exchange. The total engine function is antisymmetric for all the levels in the band. But the space ending function for the intermediate levels is neither symmetric nor antisymmetric. Instead, the space ending function of each of these levels has what might be called a mixed symmetry, there being a different mixed symmetry for each intermediate level. The net result is a gradual transition of the electron charge distribution from one that leads to a minimum energy to one that leads to maximum energy in going from the bottom to the top of the band. The reason why only two levels in a band can have a space engine function with a well-defined symmetry that is either symmetric or antisymmetric is that the level exchanges are carried out two at a time. As we go to a system containing n atoms, of a given species, each level of one of these atoms leads to an n-fold degenerate level of the system, where the atoms are well separated. With decreasing the separation, each of these splits into a set of n levels. The spread in energy between the lowest and highest level of a particular set depends on the separation distance r. Since r specifies the amount of overlap that causes the splitting but it does not depend significantly on the number of atoms in the system. Each set of split levels contains more and more levels spread over about the same energy range at a particular R. At the values of R found in the solid, a few angstroms, the energy spread is the order of the few electron volts. If we then consider then the solid contains something like 10 to 23 power atoms per mole, we see that the levels of each set in the solid are so extremely closely spaced in energy that they form a practically continuous energy band. The process we have just described is indicated in figure 2. We see from the figure that the low-lying energy levels are spread less than those that apply higher. The reason is that the electrons in low levels are electrons in inner substance of the atoms, which are not significantly influenced by the presence of the nearby atoms. These electrons are localized on particular atoms, even when R is the small, because the potential barriers between the atoms are for them relatively higher and light. The valence electrons on the other hand are not localized at all for small r, but they become part of the whole system. Figure 2 Top Energy Level Scheme for two isolated atoms Middle Energy Level Scheme for the same two atoms in a diametric molecular Bottom Energy Level Scheme for four of the same atoms in a rudimentary one-dimensional crystal. Note that the lowest lying levels are not split appreciably because the atomic and agent functions for these levels do not overlap significantly. The overlapping of their wave functions results in the spreading of their energy levels. It should be po pointed out that the is level of an individual atom becomes a band of n levels, as does the second s level, if we count in such a way that each of these can accommodate two electrons of opposite spin. But the second p level is triply degenerate in the space quantum number m sub l, 
in the isolated atom. Since m sub l can assume any of the values minus 1, 0, plus 1. Thus the second p level in the atom leads to 3 n levels in the solid. As we shall discuss soon, this can be thought of the forming three bands of n levels whose energy range may or may not co co coincide. In figure 3, we show the band formation for the higher levels of sodium whose ground state atomic configuration is first S2, second S2, second P6, third S1. Several general features of the allowed bands, the continuous bands of energy levels for electrons and forbidden bands, the regions where there are no electron energy levels, are illustrated in this figure. Allowed bands corresponding of inner subshells, such as second P in sodium, are extremely narrow until the interatomic spacing becomes smaller than the value actually found in the crystal. As we go through the outer occupied subshells and into the unoccupied subshells of the atom in its ground state, however, the bands become progressively wider at a given interatomic separation. The reason is, again, that the greater the energy of the electrons are larger the regions in which we can move and the more they are affected to nearby ions. As the energy increases, therefore, the successive allowed bands widen and they overlap each other in energy. Figure 3 showing the formation of energy bands from the energy levels in isolated sodium atoms as the interatomic separation decreases. The dashed lines indicate the observed interatomic separation in solid sodium. The several overlapping bands that constitute each P or D band are not indicated. Direct experimental verification of energy bands comes from observations of X-ray spectra in solids. For example, the third S to second P transition in sodium gives the L-series X-ray lines. A very sharp line spectrum is observed for gaseous sodium in which the third S and second P levels are narrow. But the same X-ray lines from so Solid sodium are broad broadened because also the low lying second P level remains narrow. The third S level has now become an energy band. The observed shape of X ray lines from solids agrees with the energy band picture. Consider now the occupation of the energy levels. These bands which originated in levels of closed subshell electrons of the insulated atom have all their level occupied. The bands that originated from valence electrons may or may not be fully occupied. If an electric field is applied to the solid, the electrons will acquire extra energy only if there are available empty levels within the range of energy that the strength of the applied field allows the electrons to gain. If there are no nearby empty levels, when the electron will not be able to gain any energy of O, and so the solid behaves like an isolator, insulator. That counts in determining the emptiness or fullness of the bands containing valence electrons is the valence of the atoms forming the solid, and the geometry of the crystal lattice into which they solidify. An isolated band will be full if a unit cell of the crystal lattice contains two valence electrons, one for each of the two possible values of the spin quantum number m sub s. Crystal structure geometry or crystallography is a complex subject that is very important in any detailed state study of solid state physics. We avoid it in the text by restricting ourselves to particularly simple, usually one-dimensional crystal lattices. We shall, however, define a unit cell as the smallest geometrical arrangement of atoms that by periodic repetition along the coordinate axis, axis can fully describe the geometrical arrangement of the atoms in the complete crystal.
We shall also say that in the crystal lattice sum, sum or all the degeneracy of the atomic valence electron levels with respect to the quantum number m sub l is removed because these electrons are not in the spherically symmetrical potential of an atom in free space, but in a potential whose more complicated symmetry depends on the crystal geometry. For this reason, reason the three degenerated levels from an P subshell of a single atom led to three bands of N levels, each cap capable of hel holding two electrons on opposite spin in crystal containing N of these atoms. The bands may be completely non-overlapping, partly overlapping or completely overlapping in energy, depending on the crystal geometry. The term is the late band, used in expressive, the condition for full band refers to a case in which the bands do not overlap each other or bands from other subshells. Then if there are two pilot electrons per unit cell, each of the n levels in the lowest lying band will have its full complement of two electrons. Note that the quantity determining occupation is the number of valid electrons per unit cell are not per atom. In a uniform one-dimensional lattice of levels of identical atoms, such as considered in the argument from which it is concluded that the band contains n levels if the crystal contains n atoms. A unit cell contains one atom and there is no dis distinction to the mate. When that argument is extended to three-dimensional crystals containing atoms of different species, it is found that the conclusion remains the same, providing n is the number of the unit cells in this crystal. Thus, is, if there are two valence electrons per unit cell, there will be two in at each of the levels of the band, and the band will be fully occupied. The problem is predicting whether there or not a solid in an insulator is that the question of band overlap is all important, and this depends on details of the geometry of the crystal structure and the geometry of the atomic agent functions. If what as far as valence in consonant might be have been a completely filled band actually overlaps what might have been a completely empty band, then there will be two partly filled bands. The result is that a solid that might be have been an insulator will actually be a conductor. But is it at least possible to say that a solid can certainly not be an insulator unless one of its unit cells contains of even number of valence electrons, because an odd valence electron can never be an affiliate band. Most covalent solids like diamond or ionic solids like sodium chloride are insulators. They, are, they all have an even number of valence electrons per unit cell. In diamond, each carbon atom has four valence electrons, and there are two atoms in each unit cell. The eight valence electrons per unit cell fully occupied the four n levels of four bands. One originated from the second s subshell of the atom, and three originated from the three second p subshells. These bands overlap each other by their they are well separated from the empty higher energy bands. Sodium chloride contains one sodium ion and one chlorine ion per unit cell, and the valence band consists of set of completely filled bands that overlap each other but do not overlap unfilled bands. Alkali is atoms like beryllium as are divalent and form crystals with an even number of valence electrons per unit cell. But the solids are metals, not insulators, because overlapping bands make a slightly higher in unfilled levels energetically available to the electrons. In solids formed from the monovalent alkali atoms, like sodium, the band containing the valence electrons cannot be filled, and so the solid behaves like a conductor. Only half of the levels of the isolated 
third as a load band of sodium are filled because a sodium atom has a single electron in the third S level. Where is the exclusion principle allows such a level to accommodate two electrons. Hence electrons in the solid can easily acquire a small amount of additional energy. Thus any apl applied electric field will be effective in giving electrons energy and the solid will be a conductor. As we maintained in the previous lecture, conductors are also found in cases where bands containing valence electrons overlap. It is worthwhile putting the distinction between conductors or insulators into momentum instead of energy language. Without an applied electric field, there are as many electrons in the solid with momentum vectors in one direction as there are with momentum vectors in the opposite direction, since there is no net current. When an electric field is applied, this equilibrium can be upset causing a current to flow if some of the electrons can go into quantum states with changed momentum vectors. This is quite possible for electrons in a partially filled band, but it cannot be done by electrons in completely filled band. At temperatures above absolute zero, it is of course possible for some electrons to gain enough thermal energy to jump over the energy gap of a forbidden band of energy into a higher alloyed band, thereby creating vacancies in the low alloyed band and making a new alloyed band available. We speak of the ne nearly filled band as a valence band and the nearly empty band a conduction band. The probability of this happening increases with temperature and it depends strongly on the width of the forbidden band. Substances in which the width of the energy gap is small are called semiconductors. An example is silicon, a covalent solid with a diamond-like structure, but with a forbidden band only about one electron volt wide. It becomes reasonable conducting at room temperature. So, at low temperatures, it is an insulator. On the other hand, the gap between the fillet and empty alloy bands is diamond is about 7 electron volts. Thus, diamond is an insulator even at relatively high temperatures. Some useful results concerning conduction electrons in metals can be obtained from classical ideas. In the absence of the applied electric field, the directions in which these electrons move are random. The reason is that the electrons frequently collide with imperfections in the crystal lattice of the metal, which arise from the thermal motion of the ions about the equilibrium positions in the lattice of, from the presence of impu impurity ions in the lattice. In col colliding with these imperfections, the electrons suffer changes in speed and direction, and this makes their motion random. As in the case of molecular collisions in a classical gas, we can describe the frequency of the electro electron lattice imperfection collisions by a mean free pass lambda, where lambda is the average distance that an electron travels between collisions. When an electric field is applied to a metal, the electrons modify their random motion in such a way that on the average they drift slowly in the direction opposite to that of the field because their charge is negative with the drift speed V sub D. This drift speed is very much less than the effective instantaneous speed V of the random motion. In copper V sub D is of the order of 10 to minus 2 power centimeter per second whereas V average is the, of the order of 10 to 8 power centimeter per second. The drift speed can be calculated in terms of the applied electric field E and of E aver V average and lambda. When a field is applied to an electron in the metal, it will experience a force of magnitude E multiplied E 
which will give an acceleration of magnitude a given by A equals E multiplied E divided M. Consider now an electron that has just collided with a latest imperfection. In general, the collision will momentarily destroy the tendency to drift and the electron will move in a truly random direction after the collision. Just before its next collision, the electron will have changed with a velocity on the average by A multiplied lambda divided the average, where lambda divided the average is the mean time between collisions. We we'll call this the drift speed V sub D so that V sub D equals A multiplied lambda divided V average V average equals E multiplied E multiplied lambda divided M multiplied V average. If N is the number of conduction electrons per unit volume and J is the current density, we have V sub D equals J divided in and multiplied E equals E multiplied E multiplied lambda divided M multiplied V average. Combining the, this with the definition of the resistivity, rho equals E divided J gives us rho equals M multiplied V average divided N multiplied E square multiplied lambda. Formula number First A. Equation first A can be taken as statement that the metal obey Ohm's law for the quantities V average or and lambda that determine the resistivity rho do not depend, depend on the applying electric field, which is the criterion that the law is obeyed. Often we deal with the conductivity. Sigma equals 1 divided rho e equals and multiplied E square multiplied lambda divided M multiplied with this average formula first B. This can be put in more useful form the defining a measurable quantity the mobility mu of magnitude given by the ratio of the drift speed to the applied electric field it is mu equals V sub D divided E equals E multiplied lambda divided M multiplied with average. Formula first C. Then since sigma equals n multiplied E square multiplied lambda divided M multiplied V average, we have mu equal, equals sigma divided E multiplied E or sigma equals n multiplied E multiplied mu. Formula number two. If we have conduction by positive carriers as well as negative carriers, the conductivity is given by Sigma equals n multiplied q sub n multiplied mu sub n plus p multiplied q sub p multiplied mu sub p, in which mu sub n and mu sub p, p are the mobilities of the negative and positive carriers. q sub n and q sub p are their charges, and n and p are the numbers of the carriers per unit volume. If conduction is by negative charge carriers, the charge q of the carrier is negative, whereas Q is positive if conduction is by positive carriers. Since the sign of mu also depends on the sign of Q, its term is the expression for sigma is always positive. The sign of the charge carrier of electric current in a metal can be determined from the measurements of the whole effect. That is when a current carrying conducting sheet in place it perpendicular to a magnetic field an electric field is set up perpendicular both the magnetic field and the flow of the current. By measuring the potential difference between the two full faces of the conductor, it is possible to deduce the sign and value of the quantity 1 divided n sub multiplied q, called the whole coefficient. Here n is the number of charge carriers per unit volume and q is the charge of the carrier. The electric field arises from an accumulation of charge carriers on one surface due to the V sub D multiplied B force exerted on them when they move the velocity V sub D through the magnetic field B. 
In some metals, as zinc and beryllium, for example, the whole effect indicates net positive charge carriers. This is interpreted as being due to the transitions of electrons from the fillet valence band to the conduction band, leaving holes, unoccupied energy levels in the valence band. Such holes correspond to the absence of an electron and they have much like positive charges. As these frequencies are filled by electrons moving under the influence of the electric field, the holes move in the direction opposite to the electrons just as so positive charge carriers were moving in the field direction. In the case of metals within S, the S2 atomic configuration, such as zinc and beryllium, the mobility of the S-band holes is much greater than that of P-band P-band electrons. Since the sign of the hole coefficient depends on which type of carrier has the higher mobility, the hole coefficient is positive for these metals. In Table 1, we list the hole coefficients of some metals and also the number of the free electrons per atom. The latter, latter is computed from the value of the whole coefficient 1 divided n multiplied q and the density of the metal. For the alkalis and other mono monovalent metals, whole measurements agree with the one conduction electron per atom. Of course, the free electron model in which the simple whole effect analysis is based in not expected to be valid for all metals. Next slide. Applied literature. Next slide. Questions to consolidate knowledge. Thank you for your attention.